But we're going to start with the NFL as we like to do here. This is a show that leans into football and some relatively significant news in the NFL. Uh, as we've talked, and we'll bring in LeVar Arrington from his crib, but as we've talked the last few days, uh, the NFL has tabled, NFL owners have tabled the proposal to incentivize the hiring of minority coaches and GMs, the controversial suggestion of improving third round picks if you hire a black or a minority head coach or general manager. That has been tabled, but a resolution has been passed. They approved the proposal that would prevent teams from blocking assistant coaches from interviewing for coordinator positions. And reported the league also is making changes to the Rooney Rule, requiring even more minority candidates to be interviewed before a hire can be made. Progress has been made. I think Roger Goodell and Troy Vincent have done a good thing. I think the proposal that was tabled was created to create conversation and put pressure on NFL uh, ownership and executives. I think it was for Roger Goodell and Troy Vincent, the league, to say where they stood on the issue. But as I suggested uh, yesterday, Marcellus, and let's bring in LeVar Arrington on this conversation as well, there are layers to this conversation that I think the proposal that was tabled has given us an opportunity to discuss and one of them that I've been passionate about is just NFL players, black players, hiring agents to represent them that are black. I think that would do a lot to empower executives and coaches. And if we're going to claim or we're going to complain that NFL ownership won't hire us to lead the teams and organizations as individual athletes, when you have your team or corporation built around Odell Beckham Jr. Inc. or Cam Newton Inc., who do you hire? And so the question I'm going to ask you guys, Marcellus, a second-round pick, LeVar, the number two pick in the draft when he came out, do NFL players actually play a role in the lack of diversity among head coaches and general managers? Marcellus. Absolutely, they do. Um, and, and I respect what you're saying. I, I got to give credence to that. Uh, how do you want someone to trust in you if you don't show that same trust in your own, show that same value? I think that goes a long way. Uh, but I also want to talk deeper to what's happening in the culture and the mindset of the athlete and use some numbers to support it, but also just the ideology that exists, this whole ball to you fall mentality that exists with the athletes. Now, there are two things at play right here. We know that 70 plus percent of the NFL is African-American on the field. But then when you look on the sidelines, let's just stay there. Of the 32 head coaches, 24 of them did not play football at the professional level. Now, of those 24, two of them are black in terms of Brian Flores and Mike Tomlin. So that's all we have of people of color, two of the 24. Why am I giving you those numbers? Because I'm going to give you the mindset now. A lot of my teammates, and we're talking about a population that is majority black, are going to ball till they fall. And you know what that means? If you really dive into what that mentality is, that they're going to exhaust all their options to try and stay on the field. Meanwhile, others, white players, whatever you want to say, outside the black culture, is thinking maybe football on the field is not going to be a career for me. So then they transfer their mindset and energy into actually being on the sidelines or upstairs. Uh, Sean McVay actually talked about this. And Sean McVay is an interesting case because not only did he change his mindset to say, the only way I can be involved with professional football will be on the sidelines, but he also had nepotism and the networking. So think about how the black athlete is behind the eight ball when it comes to making that transition from okay, my career on the field is over, now I want to step on the sidelines, let alone upstairs as an executive. You are so far behind in that transition when you talk about where everyone else is because of their limitations. So in a sport where we say it's a meritocracy and we don't care who you are, big school, small school, whatever type of background you have, on the field is based on merit. But on the sidelines, there's more to it than just the merit. It's who made the quicker transition. Who has the head start? 
who networks, as I like to say, work the net, built those relationships. So a guy who comes off the football field, whether it's the collegiate level or pro level, if he hasn't fully committed to being on that sideline, he's putting himself at a disservice. Yeah, as an active player, I say no. And, and the reason why I say no is players have their own challenges. I was one of those guys. As you mentioned, I was a number two overall draft pick. I, I selected a black agency. I had the Poston brothers, two black agents, as my representation because I believed in empowering one another and giving my own, my own people the opportunity to represent me. If I could do it all over again, I would make the decision to maximize my career. Careers can last from two to three years on average. You have two to three years to maximize your opportunity in the National Football League as a player and as an employee. That is not my concern to try to fight a battle to be able to place other people in, in an opportunity to get a head coaching job, a GM job, or an ownership level Type, type of situation while I am trying to be the best player that I can possibly be. I don't think that that's fair to put that type of pressure and weight on someone who is spending their time trying to get employed and finally getting employed to actually put themselves in a position where they might have to, like for me, it, it compromised my career. In the end, I had a contract issue that derailed my career in Washington. So and not saying that that's a color driven thing. I'm just saying for me, I'm going to hire who I believe is going to represent my interest the best. And I'm not attaching a color to that. And as far as and again, just one last point to that, as far as looking at it as hiring an agent of the same race and background as me is going to make the difference in how agents or, or how owners view putting in uh, play, uh, people like GMs and head coaches, I think it's two entirely different conversations and and they would take place on two entirely different platforms. LeVar, I think you've argued your point very well. I, I don't want to criticize that, but I completely disagree with it. I think if you look across at white NFL players, they virtually all have white representation. I can't say that's a decision based on race. They're hiring who they believe trust can do the best job for them. I get that. But I also think we have a responsibility, particularly if we want to move up and elevate to be comfortable working with each other and empowering each other. And I do think we have a responsibility to do that. And I want to add this, and I meant to say this in the open, read a Washington Post piece uh, this morning from Robert Klimko uh, that was put out around the NFL draft. For the first time, in the history of the NFL, more than half of the first round picks were represented by black agents. So perhaps there is some progress being made in terms of how we view ourselves, who we're empowering, who we trust to represent our own little individual businesses. And I do think it would have an impact in terms of look at the, across at the NBA and how Leon Rose is getting an opportunity to run the New York Knicks. Rob Palenka got an opportunity to run the Los Angeles Lakers. These are former agents. They have all sorts of interaction with ownership. Ownership gets comfortable with them, develops a level of respect for them, and then says, hey, I think this guy can run my team. And, and to me, if more black players were represented by black agents and ownership was dealing with these agents constantly, they would start to think, Hey, maybe this guy could run my team, but also maybe I should hire someone who I think connects with this power agent. And again, Tom Condon, great friend of mine. He's from Kansas City, one of the great NFL super agents, one of the smartest guys I know. But, but just being in that position, representing the Peyton Manning and all the different guys he represented, it put him in position to earn the respect of some of the most powerful sports owners in the league. And if we can do that, for more black agents, I think we would see a trickle-down effect in the executive wing, and I think eventually it would happen in the coaches in the coaching ring as well. But but if we don't have the courage to hire our own and, and the belief to hire our own, I think it's hypocritical to insist that others hire us as well. 
So I think you argued your point well, uh, LeVar, but, but I disagree. Marcellus, you have Can a follow-up? Yeah, um, it's such a layered discussion, man. But look, David Ware, uh, who used to rep Barry Sanders, the sports attorney, uh, talked about how athletes always say things in, in nature of social awareness and social responsibility, but then they have a plantation mentality when it comes to their own representation. Uh, you should dig deeper into what David Ware experienced in his career. And it's funny that some of the top agents right now, let's talk about Nicole Lynn, the double minority, a female and a black. Uh, you talk about her situation, and she did her own research. And of all the top agents, Demarius Bilbo or uh, David Mulageta, those guys who are the top black super agents right now, you know how many white clients they have? <laughs> None. Zero. Not a single white client. So this is what Whitlock is talking about that I agree with. If you want to show that value in yourself and that value in those who are of your likeness, it does have an effect on the entire landscape. Because what happens is, the Marius Bibble talked about how when he walks into a white quarterback's or a white office alignment's home and doesn't get that player, it's the same thing as a, a, a black head coach walking into a white general manager's office. He doesn't get that opportunity because we are not comfortable enough with our own. And it's a crazy mindset to think about that it's one thing to be a black super agent, but all your clients are black. But every one of these agents have been on record saying the real crossover, the real threshold is when we get the white player to buy into us. Not because of complexion or be deterred because of complexion, but because of merit. And if we don't have that crossover effect and we don't even show that same value within our own, then we know why we're in this dire situation right now. I think you got to be very careful when we start pointing to those type of, of reasoning as to why we hire who we hire, because it actually perpetuates the other side of the discussion. If, if, if you're talking about walking into the office of a black owned and black brand NFL franchise, then the conversation dramatically is different. And, and the conversation is changed around. When we talk about these people walking in and of color, okay, their, their, their best interest isn't being represented, but yet we see a white quarterback go with a white agent. Well, generally speaking, they're going into the office with a, a white owner as well. So that is the fundamental difference between the conversation points that we're having right now, is that you're not walking into an office with all black representation to do a deal with a black owner of an NFL franchise. That's not the reality here. So we got to be careful in saying, OK, this person of color is qualified. This m minority is qualified to represent my best interest. My best interest does not have a race connected to it. My best interest is my best interest. So we have to be careful in saying, OK, in order for us to be able to sit at the table, we have to empower our own in terms of my representation versus versus the merit of what your career represents and then having the gotta conversation go, from there. Yep, yep. That, just got to be careful with it. Thanks for watching. Subscribe here to get the latest from the show and be sure to check out more of the best clips from Speak For Yourself or go watch a few segments from our other shows on FS1.